Okay, shall we make a start, everybody, because we have quite a lot to get through this morning. Um, hopefully, some more will join us uh, as we go along. So, welcome to the September Heads of Service meeting, and I hope you enjoy this meeting. Please make sure that if you've got any questions, pop them in the uh, questions and chat box, and we'll get round to answering them as soon as we can do. So, topics today, and this is what we're going to cover. Unfortunately, Sue is not well, so Claire's going to help us out with um, talking about clear face masks. I'll cover the joint guidance update. And then we have Jason, myself, Michelle Foster, and uh, Claire going to cover some things for you. Okay. So, first of all, with the joint guidance, um, we uh, this was reviewed again at the end of August and the new review was released on the 1st of September. So I hope you've actually all seen that now. There were a couple of things added into it. One on clear face masks, which um, we're going to talk about in a moment. Uh, Walk-ins, so that was people dropping in, that was covered as well. And also uh, in Appendix 8, you'll find some information there that was shared by uh, Josephine Marriage on the use and cleaning of wooden items in paediatric clinics, so like the men in the boat. So please go and have a look at that. Uh, we're not going to review it again now until uh, perhaps in December if there's, if there's any changes, but for now that's going to stand. So we're going to, to look at clear face masks now. Um, Claire, do you want to cover this? Yeah. OK, so I think this has been the long waited kind of mask for us all that we're looking for. There was a lot of talk when the um, guidance about having to wear masks in clinic came out, mainly from our patients, but also from us knowing that our communication is going to be difficult. Unfortunately, the article that came out first in the news um, was a little bit misleading. Um, and I think you saw that possibly on our Facebook page. So we've been trying to get more information and hopefully also on the webinar today, we have Frankie from Action on Hearing Loss, who's been really helpful in getting us some more information. So the NHS procurement team in some regions have sourced and ordered and received some of these masks and some of you may already have your hands on them. So. They're not CE marked, but they've been given exemption from that um, from the health and safety executive. So they are approved for situations where we would normally be wearing a fluid resistant type 2R mask, but they're not the same as they're not close fitting barriers and they don't filter anything. So your own local infection protection group will have to make sure that they're happy for you to use them before you can. You just go on to the next slide for me, Kat. So this is a statement that came out of HSE. So just give you time to read this. So basically it's giving us the exemption of, although it's not CE mark, that we can use them. Um, but definitely not when anything aerosol generating is being carried out because they are not safe enough for that. So, as we've said, it's not really a surgical mask, so we can't compare them together and they can't be tested against the same standard. So it's like a, a mini visor, but for the bottom half of your face. So it's not... Um, it's more of a barrier, so if you cough, it will be seen by everybody, um, essentially. Um, there's no filtration at all because it's just a hard surface. Um, but therefore, it is completely fluid resistant, but it's open at the sides. I don't know if you can see on the picture there on the side of her cheeks, it is completely open. Um, so there are some, that's why your own infection protection team do have to make sure that they're happy with it in your own clinic. There's some anecdotal feedback from the people that have been able to trial this. And I know the team in uh, Wales have been part of the pilot for this um, and their patients really, really like it. But you can be a little bit uncomfortable. If you can see where the top bit sits across her nose, um, 
that's a little bit more difficult to breathe than with your um, surgical mask. So they get a bit of get take a bit of getting used to essentially, um, and they do still fog up a little bit, but they are much better than anything else we have at our disposal at the moment. So Kath, I don't know if Frankie was there and able to talk or not. Yeah, if, if Frank is uh, on the uh, webinar, if you want to say a little bit more, because I know you've been quite proactive in um, getting these into the NHS for us. I can't see her on the attendees list at the moment, Kath. OK. All right. OK. All right. Perhaps, so perhaps any, any questions, pop them in the chat box and we can feed that back to Frankie. Um, and the other teams that we've worked with to get more information about this and we can always put that on the um on our website uh one thing i have seen online it's wearing glasses with them can be a little bit tricky so not just whether they're steaming up or not but just the amount of space on your face makes it a little bit tricky so but keep putting your questions in the chat things and we can feed them back to the team that have trialed them anyone else who has trialed them um and Frankie action on as well. Thanks, Kath, for that. Thank you, Claire. Okay. So um, I'm now going to introduce Jason Smalley to talk about. So he's been very proactive at, recently in uh, the newborn hearing screening program um, and talking to um, Public Health England. So I'm going to hand over to him and he can update you. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Hello, morning everyone. Um, so first part is about the modelling tool. So um, if you're a paediatric service or part of a paediatric service, hopefully you've now received this in the last few week, in the last few days um, from NHS England or from your local provider or from your screening and IMS board. Um, some of it's gone to the um, newborn screening managers, some of it's come to audiology departments, but essentially the idea of this tool is that it's designed to show the local screening and IMS boards exactly where each service is at and um, how much of a backlog there still is within the programme. So we now have a clinically consistent definition of backlog for both screening and initial assessment, which was the, the first period of work. And essentially what that backlog is, is that is well babies who are over the age of four weeks of old, four weeks of age who have not been screened, where their screen has been delayed for COVID capacity reasons. And that's babies where their initial audiology assessment has been delayed beyond KPI2 because of COVID capacity reasons. Um, so it's only the ones that are delayed that we are now classing as backlog it's not the whole cohort of babies which was the early which was one of the problems in the in the early days a couple of weeks ago to fill this in it requires quite a bit of joint working between audiology and the screening services and there's sections on both so um, there's quite a bit of data export and data move around from s for h the the stuff on how to do that is actually on s for h and there's quite a detailed talk through of how to do that um, but it does completely rely on the s for h data so before if you think if you haven't yet filled it in my best advice to you is before you fill it in make sure your data on s for h is up to date so if you've seen that baby this morning and you want to run it this afternoon for your audiology assessment put that baby's data and outcome on S4H, make sure that as much of the outcomes and data is, as, as possible is on S4H before you, run, before you run any of the searches. And then the final question on the audiology tab is one about behavioural testing weighting. And that's just to let you know that it has been raised that this is beyond the scope and commissioning of the screening and IMS boards. Um, it was felt though that it was important to include some measure of just how the eight month service for behavioral testing is is currently performing because obviously that data is not achievable in any other way they're all part of d 
BM01. They're, they're mixed in with a lot of adult data. So it was impossible for us to sort of say, how is it actually affecting the, the eight month behavioral weight? Go to the next slide. So once you um, do all the data exports and you import it into the data, you, it actually does the screening tab completely for you. So this will completely be populated by your data and there's absolutely nothing from a screening point of view that you need to do. But if we get to the next slide, there's quite a bit that needs filling in on the audiology data. So the audiology data gives you the ages of the babies waiting, the number of referrals and whatnot. But we've I've managed to get we've managed to work with PHE to get into the tool the idea that each service can then review those babies that are waiting to say actually are they part of the backlog or are they just still medically unfit for testing or have I actually just sent that baby for eight months behavioural because I didn't have the capacity at the time, they were a unilateral referral and our, our documents allowed you to do that back in, the, back in the height of the pandemic when most services weren't open. The idea of this is you then send this to your screening and IMSS boards, who, who are the people that commission the screen at the moment, and they will then have hopefully an accurate picture of where each service is um, with regards backlog, because we have come across some, some parts where what, what services are saying doesn't match with the national data picture. And, it proves difficult to marry the two. So the the idea behind this is this is a this is a tool for services to use so that we can get back to hopefully business as usual for the screen as soon as possible. Um, so we go on to the next bit. So um, one thing that's massively come out across this is just in a in a sense what a situation paediatric audiology and screening and initial diagnostics less so the screening but especially the initial diagnostics and later paediatric audiology is in with regards data so for example it, it, it is impossible to pull later paediatric data out to see what waiting times are like for just paediatrics and so Kath and myself sat down and Kath very kindly wrote a letter to NHS England to basically say, look, we need an urgent review into paediatric audiology, especially given the fact that um, uh, PHE is going. So we need to know exactly what's happening with that and we should be able to feed into that discussion. And to immense surprise, really, from my point of view, NHS England actually agreed. And so led by the BAA and the NDCS, because it was felt that it was very clear that we needed some form of patient input into this and third sector input. And with representatives from BART, BAPA, um, the BSA and others, we formed a working group uh, we, where we first met on Friday and the plan is an urgent review into paediatric audiology that will cover the whole pathway, so screening, initial diagnostic, hearing aid fitting, children not referred from the screen, etiology, waiting times, commissioning, national oversight. Essentially we've left nothing out of scope with regards what it covers but we've really shortened the scope in the sense that we are not gonna deliver fine detail. Um, so it will be broad stroke recommendations with the idea that the fine detail is sorted later. Um, it's chaired at the moment by myself and Vicky. And since I wrote these slides on Friday and sent them for today, um, we've now had uh, input from back from NHS England and PHE to say actually um, PHE is gone by April. We want to decide where the screening programme and all the screen is going sort of November time so that we can put this in place. So the timetable has moved significantly forward and we've had a discussion, a brief email discussion with some members of the group this morning and it's felt that the time scale of Christmas 2020 will now probably become mid-October 2020. 
So if we go just to the next one, yeah. So to help us with that, um, as I say, the idea is bigger picture, not final detail. Um, the groups come up. So the first thing I asked the group to do is come up with three things. If you were going to change paediatric audiology, what three things would you change? Um, and so we've come up with some ideas. Now, I've had a quick flick through them. And to be honest with you, out of think there's, there's, I think there's 11 of us on the, on the group. All of us have got very, very similar ideas for the, for the three things. But I wanted it just to open it a bit wider. So um, we're going to have to do this quite quickly. So probably I'm going to close this by the end of the week or sort of Monday of next week. But the, if you can feed into this as a head of service, it would be great. And it's just to say, so there's a survey monkey at the link at the bottom. I will feed that to Victoria and we, we'll put it on the website and put it on the Facebook group, etc. But the idea is it's completely anonymous. There's literally just three questions and it says, what three, if you could change three things in paediatric audiology, what would you change? First thing, second thing, third thing. So my example there is, for example, paediatric audiology should be commissioned and have waiting times separate from those of adult audiology. That, that's just an idea. You might not agree with that, but that is just an idea to, to get you started. And I think that's where we are at the moment. Thank you very much, Jason. And, and thanks to the team. And, you know, they work very hard on behalf of all paediatric services um, uh, in, in, in England especially, but hopefully that this will spread around. Can I just say that uh, Vic, Vic's put the survey monkey into the chat box if people want to do that as soon as possible? Amazing, yeah, that'd be great, thank you. Okay, and if any questions for Jason in there, um, we can we can pass those on and... Um, I'll get back to them, no problem. Just... Okay, thank you very much, Jason. No worries, thank you. So um, I'm going to cover now uh, just some things that, that you might be interested in and in what we get uh, um, involved in sort of behind the scenes quite often. Um, sometimes you see the output of that, but not as we go through working it. So um, I uh, sit on two other groups that, that, we, that we call our partners. One of these is the PCHN, which is the Person Centred Hearing Network. And this is led by the IDA Institute. Uh, and this includes, there's 27 organisations in this uh, from around the world. Um, uh, and that includes uh, like professional bodies like ourselves, BSAs in that, BSHA, um, use universities, so universities around the world that um, provide audiology um, courses. And then there's patient representative groups such as Action on Hearing Loss and the equivalents in those other countries. So it's quite a diverse body and really interesting, a great group of people. And the other one is the Hearing Alliance. It's been going a little bit longer than the PCHN. And this is UK based and it would really a similar thing. It includes representatives from the professional bodies like ourselves, uh, patient representative groups, um, but also from here and Vision as well, and patient representatives. And we have an independent chair for that who's called Brian Lamb. So I just want to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that have been happening with these. So the Person Centred Hearing Network um, has been going at one year exactly. I attended two meetings, one on the 18th of August and one on the 31st of August and as it's an international uh, meeting um, uh, this was late at night for, for us in the UK, so uh, more, more towards the midnight uh, area. Uh, Charlotte, who's one of our other directors on board, also sits on the PCHN. So we had a catch up at, to see what other professional bodies were doing uh, around the, the world in August. And it was quite interesting. And I think I put that in my blog on Horizons that uh, that we actually cover some of the same things and we were all facing exactly the same challenges. The 31st of August meeting included all representatives, so just not just the professional bodies. And uh, what Ida was saying was that actually there's been quite a large increase in traffic to the Ida website and especially around telecare, which obviously we've been really pushed to use a lot more. 
they've had 25 uh, articles, a, a little bit more, published on patient-centred care, and that was just in the first half of 2020. So it's quite quite interesting too. And uh, if you didn't know, there is a new international standard for patient-centred care, and that re references the IDA resources that we have. So global updates. This is uh, what we've all been experiencing and especially around students and I know this is the case for us in the UK as well that students are missing out on experiential learning uh, with the placements not being available they were told to um, to not attend these and um, what we're finding around the world not probably so much in the UK but there's a social divide in education that poorer students in some parts of the world are missing out a lot more. The patient organisations um, they're finding that social isol isolation because of COVID um, has been a major problem for a lot of people, especially with mental health. And there's an increase in virtual connections, which we obviously know that, uh, about. And again, clear face masks come up. There's been lots of lobbying globally. So, you know, action on here and, us and ourselves in the UK. Um, but around the world, the, there's been a lot of lobbying, lobbying to get these made available to all services that require them. And of course, again, we're all having the same issues. Um, so the PCHN has actually produced some communication tips for improving communication when wearing face masks. As we know, this is quite um, a big factor because face masks cut down on certain frequencies, so it makes it much more difficult to hear some speech sounds. Uh, so that's on the IDA website, but I have a, the next slide. I, I'm just it just shows you what what that uh, communication tip is about. But I advise going to the website and um, downloading it to use. With our professional organisations, um, there's a lot are, are in terms of financial concerns, and that is the case for us because we we had to stop some services for a little while. We're starting to get going again, but it is an income factor into trusts and into private sector as well. So there's a lot of financial concerns around getting started, uh, a lot of pressure to start face-to-face uh, -face, uh, consultations too. The PPE has come up again the, um, about the lack of efficacy research, and that is around, of course, the clear face masks again. Um, we've all produced some COVID health and safety policies, and we've shared these uh, internationally, by the way. Uh, and then there was some talk about what what is uh, the definition of an audiology emergency. So, you know, the, the urgent uh, patients that we need to see. And then there's an awful lot on e-audiology and telepractice. And looking again, is this where we're going to continue in the future? You know, it, it, we started it. It's, is it something that we will drop or is this something that we will continue? And if we do, then what is essentially going to be appropriate and how well does that fit for all our patients? So the um, PCHN have some projects. They, uh, the, the first four projects on here uh, were started last year when this first set up. Um, so again, the first project was around getting a definition of uh, patient-centred care, and that's now on the IDA website, so you can use that. The second project was We're All Ears, and that was uh, about taking some of those elements of patient-centred care um, uh, and uh, making it around patient centred counselling, so those who do counselling will, will recognise what that is. There's going to be a, a campaign to be launched late October, so watch out for that and we'll be uh, publishing that as well. And then the third project was around making patient centred care happen, so you know the tools that uh, they've set up and provided and the information research around that is available. Um, on the IDA website too, and that's ongoing. Then the third, fourth project was around curriculum guidelines in patient centre care, and this was aimed at um, getting patient centre care embedded in audiology training programmes around the world. And there's tools and resources being developed for those, of course. So the, there's a new project now that they've started, and that's called Future Hearing Journeys. Um, and so this is about an, it's a new landscape in hearing care, and um, this is all around how COVID has changed, how we've de had to react and develop uh, different approaches to uh, to hearing care 
for our patients. So from the 18th of September, which is this week, to the 1st of October, the IDA will be um, contacting and reaching out to all health professionals. And again, we will, we will publish this. Uh, patient organisations and universities to look at trends and to work with focus groups around this. So uh, the next meeting that we have in this is the 19th of November uh, for part of this group. So that's just the European, South African and Australian uh, part of um, PCHN. And this is around creating innovative solutions. Oh dear, this is, this is uh, right, okay. I apologise for this slide. It, it, it was correct when I set it up. Um, you might have to bend your head a little bit because I'm not quite sure how to, to, to rectify this as it's uh, live at the moment. Uh, but if you go on, on the IDA website, this is the uh, communication tips that they've got. So some good useful tools on there uh, might be useful to print out and, and display for your patients. So I'm going to just chat around the Hearing Alliance and uh, you know our past president's been involved in this and the present before that. Um, so this, um, this group looks at um, the, the care that we give to our patients. So this is around ensuring the quality of patient care across all our sectors okay, and what we need to look at to, uh, to develop these. So at the moment, um, we're, they're looking at the long-term implications of telehealth um, uh, and obviously the issues around that about we can't look into patients' ears if, we, if we're doing this before we fit devices. It's about limiting face-to-face -face contact. And what about the patients who actually can't engage with remote technology and making sure that they're not excluded. So, so we're, we're not providing you know, a, a difference in care. Everything that should be uh, provided for a patient is provided whether it's telehealth or not. So um, we know that there hasn't been a lot around patient experience, and this is what we need to know from all of you, actually. It will be a good project to do. There are some out for paediatrics at the moment, but not for adults. So this is what will be the next stage to get some, um, some research around patient experience of telehealth uh, in audiology. And obviously, we know that there have been IT governance issues, um, you know, making sure that we work safely with the uh, telehealth, especially virtual plat platforms uh, where we've got visual things going on. And then we talked about assistive devices and how these are needed much more now that this, you know, people are wearing face masks. Um, and it was quite interesting that NICE had previously not encouraged that. They, they didn't think it was um, uh, useful for provision generally for uh, assistive devices. Although hearing aids are not assistive devices, patients have to provide these themselves or they go through access to work for them. Uh, the research around this is quite poor about the efficacy of assistive devices. So that's probably an area that might need to be taken up from one of our research, um, research uh, organisations. Uh, so now what we're trying to do is pull all this together and to see if this, the Hearing Alliance is able to influence uh, better provision of for patients with hearing loss. So that's where we're up to with both of these at the moment. So I'll keep you up to date. As I say, you know, quite often we don't see the outcome of these, but it's nice, I think, to know what we're doing behind the scenes as well as the, as the board. Uh, I want to uh, include in here, uh, there's Ida have got a paediatric project that they want you to get involved with. So uh, they're looking for paediatric audiologists who can volunteer to assist with a small project. Now, when I talk through this, it's um, <laughs> it, there's quite a lot to it, so I'll, I'll cover that in the next slides. So this is um, something that's been set up with um, Chris English, who's the professor of uh, emeritus uh, in the US. And the idea is to provide a module, so an IDA module on person-centered care in paediatrics um, and some more paediatric tools for the IDA university courses. So um, what they would like is they want to they, they want more of a visual thing. So to to what these tools like look like in action in practice, and there that's where that you come in. So so this is what they want you to do next. So that they're talking about videos also for uh, young children and also young people. So these are the things that they they want to cover. So there's there's quite a few on here. So you could get involved in any one of these. 
Um, they're going to want to set up some, some video. So this is about living well for teens and tweens, growing up with hearing loss. So what it's like for young people to have hearing loss um, and their real uh, lived experiences with that. Uh, my turn to talk for parents. Uh, there's an Ida Telecare for tweens and teens, and that includes living well online. And this is focused on probably mental health issues as well and improving communication for them. And of course, you know, we have now uh, lots more tools and lot more, lots more technology that it makes it much easier for young people uh, to have that communication. But what is that like in reality for them? And then My World. So this is initially being filmed by the Australian um, groups, but I think they want to open it up to, to look what it's like in other areas as well. And then uh, a paediatric version of My Hearing Explained. So there's already one for adults on the IDA website, but they want a paediatric one now. So I hope that you might be able to get um, involved in these. They're saying that it doesn't require extensive training uh, for clinicians to use, but you'll need to have permission from, obviously, from where you work to, to do the filming. And that's that's a standard thing, really. They have disclaimers as well around filming, so to, just to make sure it's OK. Um, so if you'd like to get involved in that, then um, we'll put the we'll put the details on. It's to contact Natalie Comas or Ina Nielsen um, at the Ida Institute. And uh, like I say, it would be a, a great thing if you could get involved in that, especially in the UK. OK, so now I'm going to pass over to Michelle Foster, who is the uh, board director uh, for healthcare science, and she gets quite heavily involved in the CSO. Um, so I'll pass it over to you now, Michelle, if that's OK. Morning, everyone. I hope everyone's OK um, and that you can hear me. Um, there's quite a few webinars that the CSO office have been doing. Um, this tended to be about monthly. So if you want to get involved and you aren't involved already, I'll put the um, email address on the chat for you. But the last one was in August and it included Professor Dame Sue Hill, Angela Douglas and Professor um, Bernie Ferry. Could you give me the next slide, please? <coughs> Um, so the um, updates were that there's going to be um, an increase in national testing capacity um, and that's going to be set up in September and November um, and that there'll be an announcement of different ways that communities will be tested and targeted um, with relation to COVID. They're also going to pilot um, a study with asymptomatic staff to understand how often the NHS staff um, workforce need to be checked. Um, the NHS people plan, they're going to draft up um, a healthcare science response to that and that should be out towards the end of September. Um, so they're wanting to create a culture of belonging and inclusion and to grow the workforce and recruit and develop new roles such as advanced practitioners. Um, to support this, um, they've got a place on the new Diagnostic Workforce Programme Board um, and sitting under this, um, there are five pillars. Um, there'll be pathology imaging, endoscopy, genomics and physiological measurements. So the CSO will have these programme boards and they're setting up these diagnostic hubs and then the workforce work will feed in into an executive level. Um, so to help um, people be able to feed in their workforce things. They've started um, with supporting regional leads. So if you don't know who your regional CSO healthcare science lead is, um, please email the BAA admin and I'll let you know who your regional lead is. But the regional leads will be linking into the ICS through the medical director and then the workforce stuff will be fed back to that um, workforce board as well. Sorry, my phone's decided to ring now as well. Um, they're wanting stories um, to um, put into the people plan. So if you've got any great stories of different skill sets or um, things that happened during COVID, then please let them know as well. Um, and um, so just email them directly. I'll put that in the chat box as well. Um, can I have the next slide, please? 
Um, so the update from the national school was that um, they've increased their STP provision this year and they're looking at different ways of recruiting people. So um, that's going to carry on. Um, and they've got a new draft framework. Um, they're going to keep the apprenticeships level two, three, four, five, and seven, the PTPs and the STPs. Um, but they're doing a horizon scan now um, as to look at different routes that they can support people coming into um, different careers. So they're doing credentialing as to people who perhaps don't want to take the whole STP programme or have got parts of um, skill mixes that they can carry over so they're looking at different ways where they can do short courses to um, get the skill mix they need perhaps with diplomas an undergraduate certificate a postgraduate certificate and they're going to increase um, clinical academic careers for those yeah. who would like um, that career route the other thing the cso are going to do is they're going to do um, a, a drive a publication um, a campaign to get people interested in NHS careers because COVID's highlighted the a role the NHS plays. So there is a lot more people wanting and seeking out NHS careers. So they're going to do something around the healthcare science piece with that. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, this is quite short notice, but they're doing a webinar on the 21st of September because they're launching an innovation fellowship. Um, I have put the link on there and I'll put that in the chat box if you want to um, go on to the um, webinar. But it's for anyone who's got new innovations that they are dreaming up or would love to get into the NHS. Um, they want to support you and it's um, funded by the NIHR charity, um, the National School of CSO um, and the private sector as well. Um, it is a 12 month commitment but that webinar will tell you a lot more detail. So do join that webinar, um, email them or join that link which you've been put in the chat box anyway um, and just find out a little bit more about the um, new innovation fellowship yeah yeah um, that's me yeah, done no thank you thank you very much michelle um so yes please go and have a look at those um i'm sure you know we've all got lots of uh, good innovation projects and we don't often shout about them so yeah let's let's try and make that happen okay so now can i um introduce uh, claire who's going to talk about our wonderful uh, world of webinars <laughs> thanks Kath. um so yeah so obviously i hope you've all been aware that we're running these um twice monthly webinars since july since we stopped the twice monthly uh, head of service webinars and shared with everybody um, so we've covered things like career development um, in the first one we then had a couple on tinnitus we're in the middle of implantable devices month so uh, next wednesday our webinar will be looking at um, considerations when you're comparing um, bone conduction and middle ear, ear middle ear implants um, I know that's for quite a number of us it spans different um, departments as well so for us here we will do the bone conduction implants um, but our implant team do the middle ear implants and therefore working out where these patients go can be quite tricky so we've got Andrew Sulby from Guys and St Thomas is coming to do the webinar on that for us um, in October we move into paediatrics and if you've been tempted by Kath's overview of um, the IDA projects, IDA are running the webinar on the 14th of October looking at the telecare tools for teens and tweens. So if you need a bit more information about that um, before signing up to their projects, the 14th of October is the one for you. We also then have um, on our second October webinar on the 28th, um, the neuroscience of speech and language. Um, so the importance of early access to sound. That's by Dr. Paul Johns, um, who we were inviting to conference in November, but has kindly offered to do the webinar for us instead. So he's a consultant neuropathologist um, from St. George's University Hospital. So really good one for paediatrics. Then November, and we start off with a bit of adult rehab from um, one of the conference team, David Maidment. Um, 
looking at alternative devices and hearables and all the kind of new technology that's coming on to our kind of the marketplace as well. We also have an extra one. We launched back in March our Cochlear Champions um, programme alongside BCIG. And as a follow up to the workshop that we ran at BCIG conference for all the champions, we've got a webinar for them updating their knowledge and their progress on the 29th of September as well. So then that leads us into what would have been, I'm going to give a slight dramatic pause because I'm missing it, conference week. So rather unusually compared to other societies, we're not um, having a virtual conference. We just felt it was, it was just a bit of an overload, really. There's so many now um, that we've chosen to do more of a bite size approach so you can dip in and out of things. And these webinars are all completely free to BAA members. So there's no registration, there's no sign up required at all, apart from just to register. So we've selected some of the keynote speakers that we were going to have um, at conference to do the webinars for us. So we've got quite a wide range of different topics coming up. Um, so on the slide that you can see now, you've got the overview of what's currently booked in. We're still finalising a few more. So this is going to be updated. So keep an eye on the website to see what else is coming out and look on our social media where we'll be promoting that and Horizons. The one I really want you to draw your attention to is the AGM. We know it's a popular thing at conference. Um, we've got quite a lot of information this year to share with you. Um, so please do try and find some time to join us for our AGM to make sure that we're quorum for a start. Um, there's been quite a number of different changes on board with board members standing down. So there's some elections going on. We're also going to be announcing our BAA annual awards during that time as well. And to try and drag you in, we will also be having a special guest speaker to be announced at a later date. So we've just gone to the next slide for me, Kath. So we did open for abstracts and this was a brave call given that we weren't having a formal virtual conference. So thank you to everyone that submitted your abstracts. We were really pleased with the return that we got for that. So we're judging them at the moment. We're going to be making the posters available to absolutely everybody on our website in a flipbook version. Um, and that will be ready to be viewed from the 23rd of November. We're also going through the abstracts to see if there's any that we'd want to put out as webinars and that will be webinars within the conference week as well so as soon as we've decided those and got the people to agree we'll be letting you know the times and dates for that to give you as much notice as possible um, and because we weren't doing a virtual conference we didn't approach any of the companies to sponsor anything because we just didn't think it was fair as they've had a tough year as well um, but some have approached us. So we're at the moment looking at uh, a couple of sponsored webinars as well from a couple of the companies who've shown some interest. So I know you all need as much um, notice as possible to get people out now we're back in clinic. So as soon as we have dates and times, we'll be publishing those. So just keep your eyes um, peeled on our website and on your Horizons email as well. So you can just go on to the next slide for me, please, Kath. So the other thing I've mentioned is the BAA awards. Again, without the temptation of having your special walk on music and uh, all your peers seeing you get your award, um, asking for nominations for this was a bit of a risk as well, but we have had nominations for all our awards we're really pleased about. Um, and that's gone into the judging phase now um, and we'll be announcing who our winners are. we've just lost Claire's sound just for a moment now we'll just see if Thanks. she comes back thank you for oh sorry have I gone off you did <laughs> yeah you missed so much I was quite happy talking to myself so yes the awards will just um be announced at the AGM thank you for all the nominations for that we really do feel that there's been a special year that people should be recognized for what they've done over this time I'm done Kath
Thank you very much, Claire. Yes, so please, uh, yes, please jo do join us for the AGM. Um, it will be different this year, of course. Um, so it'll be nice, nice to see, it. and we will be having a special speaker, hopefully, either side of that. Okay, so um, I just want to update you on something that obviously we were challenged on some time ago. So this is about equality, diversity, and inclusion, especially for BWA and the board as well. So um, obviously, following the Black Lives Matter uh, protests, we were challenged um, for a lack of diversity of board members and what we were going to do to rectify this. So all that is on our website in our initial response. Since then, we've been working behind the scenes to understand quite a few things um, that obviously we felt what might have been missing. So we, we wanted to make sure that if, you know, does board and the committees, because we are supported by committees, and we can't function without them, and our members uh, reflect the diversity of our profession. So we had, um, we've engaged um, a, an ED&I consultant, Jill Scott, who's lovely, and very down to earth and very, um, proactive she, she she's um she she's a very sensible lady and she talked to us uh, at length i think we had an hour and a half with her um about what we were missing and what we probably needed to do um so some of the things that obviously came out of that are the things that we were not aware of and we had no idea about the true diversity of our membership because we never collected that information before so until we have that information, until we have it, we don't have the answers to know what we need to do going forward, if that makes sense. So our next steps on this is uh, we're going to have to involve all of you, all our members, and we're going to ask those questions of protected characteristics. So not just focusing on ethnicity, we want to focus on or everything. So we want to make sure we are truly, uh, we truly have inclusion here. So uh, Jajit Seti, who's uh, one of our past presidents, she's leading um, this for the CSO office, and this is around um, healthcare science. So slightly, some slight differences. So we're going to collect information, but Jajit is also going to reach out to a lot of you as well for that. And when we have that information, um, we will know actually we do truly represent our membership fully. So we wanted to do this right. We didn't want to be reactive initially about it. We wanted to do it the right way and have things embedded in place so that, you know, going forward, um, that, that we, we can clearly say that we are an inclusive organisation and that we recognise every uh, all that diversity and make sure that we, um, we are able to respond to it. So um, we hope you're all going to help us with this. And this is linking into our membership team uh, and our membership di uh, director, uh, who's Heather. Um, we're going to send um, a questionnaire out and we're hoping you're going to update your details on the web page as well. And then after that, we will look at, uh, we'll get the focus groups uh, set up properly um, and that represent the membership. And then we'll look at uh, what we need to ensure that we are uh, a fully inclusive board and committees. So, but I just want to draw your attention that last year, so the um, Service Quality Committee, who do an awful lot of work behind the scenes, they um, they worked out to produce some guidance, and this was when I was director with them as well, uh, on reasonable adjustments for audiologists. So, so looking at what existed out there, because we knew that there were some audiologists that were struggling uh, to have things put in place. So we reached out and asked if any had any disabilities. So so quite a few a number came forward to tell their stories, and we included that in uh, a presentation at the conference. But all had hearing loss. Now I know I know there are um, audiologists out there who have other disabilities, and you know we'd like to um, to know about that and what it's like for you, so that we can actually help to produce some better guidance for reasonable adjustments uh, for audiology in the workplace that work, that actually do work. So I hope also that you're going to help us with that as well. Okay, so now I'm going to um, just chat around membership benefits. This is uh, our final section and I think we're going to finish on time today, hopefully. Um, uh, now, working behind the scenes, our membership team are great and we've got an awful lot going on in terms of what we produce for you so you know it will be interesting to to know you know are these great benefits do you see them as great benefits for you and what else you might like 
So we are obviously continuing to make sure that we um, refresh things and look at um, other ideas. So please let us know. So I, I hope you've seen the, the new magazine and it's got a, a different look to it now, a different sign and layout. I, I quite like it. I hope you do too. Uh, Horizon e newsletter uh, design and content has changed too. So it's, you know, it's, it's about trying to make it a little bit more engaging for you. We've got the ongoing website development, including the CPD aspects to that as well. And that's to help you with your CPD work and also to try and help with providing some of that uh, additional educational um, um, opportunity too. So uh, some of the webinars again that are hopefully have been useful to you all. I've enjoyed quite a number of those that I've been able to get on to. But we can actually listen to them again on the website. So if you do miss them, it's not the end of the world. You can actually catch them up on our members page. And this is it. So these are all stored in the, on the members site. So we've got free access for members to the uh, 2019 conference presentations. So that's uh, from last year. And there were some really good presentations there last year. So as you can, I'm not going to read them all, but the, obviously there's there's lots of things coming up. Uh, the tinnitus modules, the online learning, we, we're working with IDA to produce some, some more uh, tools as well. So lots of things that we hope we're providing that you want. So please, please let us know. OK, so this is the New Look magazine. I'm sure you've all seen this. It's quite nice and bright. And um, I, I liked the front cover of that, that last one. It was brilliant. So it's all in mass. OK, so how can you get involved? Well, you can actually write articles for us. So if you've got anything interesting going on, anything new developments, things that you would like to share. Great. Please do that. Ask us for the magazine any new protocols that you've developed, especially over this time, uh, best practice, you know, it's great to share all these things. That's what we're about. We're a professional organization that should share these things. So that's how we grow, that's how we develop, that's how we improve things for everybody. If you've got members of your team that are, are not members already of the BAA, try and encourage them to join. I've been doing that in my department too, after I realized that some members, so some of my team weren't members. Um, student placement and if, if you've got students do encourage them to become members because it's free for them uh, get them to write about their experiences um, we've got um, a student blog as well so that would be great it's great for new students coming in to know what it's like been like for the past uh, students as well and also you know join us uh, join our committees stand for the board we've, we've had some great nominate we have had some great nominations this year but we always need more board it doesn't stay still we you're only on board for a, a specific time so and that's great because it does refresh and people bring new ideas so we always need that so even if you think oh i'm not quite sure this time think about it for the future you know if um and you don't have to be um a extrovert or anything like that we we want a good mix of people on, on this board because it's about making sure that we improve the quality and the standards and best practice for our profession. So uh, how many of you have seen the Guild? I think you've all had um, uh, an email request to, to join this from Victoria, who's worked hard to, to get all this um, set up for us. So this is a, another forum for sharing outside of the, the website uh, because it's more reactive, it's faster. Uh, and we can uh, put things on here that are current. So obviously everything about the face mask, as soon as it came out in the press, this all went on here as well. And the NHSP, Jason shared all that too. So there's some, some really good stuff on there. So yeah, please encourage other people to join this as well. Good forum for, for sharing things in the, uh, immediately. So as the board, so we do have seven spaces. Some people are, are eligible for re-election if they want to stand, that is. Uh, so our deadline is the 5th of October for nomination. So please, if you're thinking about it, get them in. And then um, you'll find the form on the website or download it from the handouts in um, on the webinar, in this section of the webinar. I think um, Victoria's put them in there for you today. Uh, and then we will have the elections uh, for those board places. Okay, so uh, everybody, thank you very much. That's that's me finished. I'm not sure we've got any questions. We've got we've got a few yeah. minutes left. 
Luca. Sorry, it's Claire. Yes. Um, we've got a couple of polls that we can put out to people as well. Oh, yes. We okay. forgot about the polls, didn't we? Yes, 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 please. Yes. So have you got those? Can you put those up? There we go. Right. So so we did want to know. So we asked this question some a, a little while ago about restarting clinics. So we'd like to know now um, how many have actually now restarted routine face to face appointments. So all you need to do on here is select one of yes or no and, uh, and submit. So I'll give you a moment or two to do that. Okay, thank you. So we should get the results of that. Oh, wow, that's great. So, wow, that's lovely. So it's showing that the, the vast majority, um, obviously of those who are attending today, are actually, have actually restarted. That's great. So for those who've said no, um, if you haven't, then please let us know what we could probably do to help support you in that or what difficulties you might be having. And um, that's what we're here for. So we've got we have another one, and this is what this is the question we were saying about telehealth. Uh, we do need to to know a little bit more about this. So, what are you using telehealth for? So, um, we we were interested in is it just for some aspects of the the service, or is it for all aspects of it? So, if you could fill this in, that would be fantastic. Okay. All right. That's really great. Yes. Lovely. So it's been used for, for lots of different things. That's that's wonderful. And I know obviously Vista, Vista, the vestibular services is not everywhere. So that's that's quite encouraging, really. So it will be interesting to get some um, some thoughts from yourselves about how how that's going with telecare. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll watch this space, I think. So thank you very much. That was that was really useful. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this morning's meeting. Um, again, sign up for the webinars, and we'll share everything that we've got today from um, from the questions and and the polls on the website after the meeting. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, yes, let us let us know if there's any. Is there any questions that we 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 need to ask now, or can we put those on the uh, there's no questions that have come through that I can see. Right, um, that's brilliant. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. And hopefully, we, if you would like, uh, what we'd like to know actually is um, how often you'd like these. Um, so, so please, yeah, put that in the the chat box, um, and um, we'll put it out as well on the website and on Horizons too. Okay, uh, have a good day. Bye for now. <laughs>